and welcome to this session of Harbor 2021. I am Sarah Barton. I'm the university chaplain at Pepperdine, and I'm here today with a father-daughter team. Thank you for both of you for being here, and I'm so eager to talk about to talk about your book. So Scott, if you could, first of all, tell me, am I saying it correctly, Tove or Tov? Well, it depends what part of the United States you live in. It is Tov, but some people say Matzel Tov, mm -hmm. and uh, I think they have some kind of accent. But it's a, it's a holem in Hebrew, usually pronounced as a long O, mm -hmm. so Tov is the proper, uh, to me, that's the proper pronunciation. That's good. Well, tell us just a little bit about what is Tov, and also what are the attributes of a church called Tove, as you've described in the book. Yeah, the um, when when Laura and I were studying about this book and what came true with the, some of the churches in the United States with abuse of women, um, one of the things that I thought to myself, this isn't this isn't what should happen in churches. Churches should be good, and they should be marked by goodness and. The number of people who responded to me when I said this in public, I wrote about it on a blog, um, sort of took me by surprise. So I thought, you know, I want to tap into this more. So we, uh, this is more my responsibility in the book. I studied Tov in the Hebrew Bible, um, which occurs a couple hundred times. And is a, I like to call it a master category of morality for the people of God. They are to be good as opposed to being evil. So Tov over against Ra. And so then I thought, well, God is Tov. God designs, you know, the first page of the Bible is all about when God looks at creation, he says it's Tov. That's his word. Very Tov. Um, <laughs> yeah, very. Yeah. Tov mode. It gets real. Right. Tovi, Tovi. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then uh, I said, God is Tov, God designs things for Tov, he wants people to be Tov, and God is so gracious that he works in our lives to transform us into people who are Tov through the Spirit. So I worked on that, and then we, we developed seven characteristics, and if you want, I could give you those now, or is that okay? I say, go ahead and, and go for it. Yes. Okay, so... We developed, uh, and this is where Laura and I worked a lot together. Um, uh, I would develop an idea and she would respond and then she would have a story and then I would work at it. We developed the ideas of empathy. Uh, a tov person nurtures empathy. A tov person nurtures grace as opposed to fear. This is really important for leaders to be gracious, grace-filled. Mm -hmm and create that culture. They nurture people first, as opposed to institutions. This is huge for the bigger your organization gets, the more you think the institution matters more than the people. Mm -hmm. We, uh, a, a culture of Tov nurtures telling the truth as opposed to lying or deceiving or telling false narratives. It nurtures justice or doing the right thing at the right time versus loyalty to the culture or loyalty to the institution. It nurtures service rather than people who are heroes and cultures, I mean, uh, celebrities. And ultimately it nurtures Christ likeness, uh, which is instead of a leader culture forms people who follow Jesus. So those are the seven, uh, we call them the habits of goodness. I loved um, moving through all of those themes with you. Thanks for, for bringing those out. And even when you're reading it, you think, okay, this is right. This is good. And so thank you for that. Um, you did have to balance this hopeful message about what is good and what God is doing in this world that is, that is Tov with the realities of um, abuses. So your book, and Laura, this question is for you. Your book is unapologetic in calling out the abuse of power in churches and specifically mentions Willow Creek Community Church and other public examples and people. So 
as you were writing this book, why was it important to be specific and what some people might critique you and say, why were you so personal? It's a personal story for us. Um, I attended, my husband and I met at Willow Creek and we were members of that church for more than 20 years. It is a place that we love. It is a place that we grew and we felt betrayed. We felt betrayed by not only by Bill Hybels, but by the leadership. When we first read the article about Bill Hybels, it came out on March 23, 2018. We at first just kind of rolled our eyes. I read the headline aloud to my husband and we were like, okay, there's no way this is true. Well, when we started reading the article and read the names of the women, these were people that we knew. We knew the family. They were family friends to us, many of them personally. My husband had been friends with Vonda Dyer. She was one of the first women to give her name. He was friends with her for over 20 years. So it be, the story became real to us when we read the names of women that we knew were people of character and people of integrity. So when we wrote the book, we, my dad and I actually never thought twice about using the names. It was always something that we felt was important to do. None of the stories, aside from the one about Carrie Latticer, all of those stories had been public. They, we weren't exposing anything new, um, but it gave, it gives the story meaning when you use names it makes a more powerful impact, I believe, with the reader. It doesn't feel watered down. It feels, it feels more real and more true to know that these are, these are real souls. These are real people that were wounded and need to be restored. Mm -hmm. and, and need a message of hope that things can be different. I think your book not only calls out the, the abuses and the ways things should not be, you do give you do provide hope that it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I did think about the dating of your book and it was published before sexual abuse um, uh, reports by Ravi Zacharias became public. And it became clear in the independent investigations of Mr. Zacharias and RZIM that there was a toxic environment around him and his ministry. So I'm wondering if you have read that report and do you think your book speaks to that situation as well? And this can, Laura, you can go ahead and answer and, and um, I'd love to hear you follow up with that. Oh yes, we, we read the report, we read it, I read it carefully. Um, I had been following the story of Lorianne Thompson, who was one of Ravi Zacharias's victims. I'd been following her story for years. I didn't know years ago that she was referencing Ravi Zacharias as her abuser at the time. So I'd been following this story unknowingly for years. We had actually spoken with some of the staff, some resistors within the staff at Ravi Zacharias months, months ago. And, um, you know, it's when the Willow Creek story broke, my dad told my husband and I right away, this story is true. And we were in disbelief at the time, kind of just felt disoriented. It was the first time that something like this had happened to us personally. Um, but what I've learned since from that conversation, and my dad would tell you the same thing, is that there's certain patterns that emerge. And we saw those same patterns emerge with Ravi Zacharias. Of course, the details are different, but one of the most telling examples for me was the institution pushing back, protecting itself, calling the women liars. Mm -hmm. That was a huge red flag for me. Dad, do you wanna say more? Yes, um, I, I agree with, uh, we, we were not, when the Ravi Zacharias story broke, it was old news to us because uh, we, had, we had consulted with some of the people and they had consulted with us and we gave them some language to use uh, that helped them and helped maybe uh, break, break through to, uh, to some light and truth at that place. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanna back up a little bit about using names. Mm -hmm. um, the women wanna hear their names vindicated mm -hmm. and legitimated that their stories are true. And when the names of the perpetrators are hidden their stories are minimized and diminished. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So we, we believed for the sake of the women, we had to tell that, but also as, um, as an educator, and you can agree with this, maybe Sarah, um, what do you know about Solomon that he had a thousand wives, mm -hmm. right? What do you know about Abraham that he gave up his wife twice to save his own skin? What do you know about David, you know, that he had an affair with Bathsheba? And I think you have a sermon about this, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the Bible tells the people stories of people, warts and all. It doesn't put cosmetics on these people. Mm -hmm. We have hagiography. And I find with my students that by telling names, it puts the fear of God in them that if, if I'm not careful, I'll be in a newspaper someday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, that was important. Yes, there's a little bit of fear of lawsuits. We had three different lawyers read this uh, manuscript. Um, and, you know, that's part of the risk you take. Um, we told the truth. We didn't try to ramp anything up and make anyone look worse than they were. Uh, but we believe the women, and we have reason to believe the women told the, the stories true. And if we don't tell those stories, um, falsehoods continue to per uh, uh, percolate in churches, and they have to be told. And I want to say one word about Carrie Lattiser. One of the reasons it was so important to, to us to tell her story, and she she agreed to tell it. She wrote it very bravely for us in the book. That was a new story, and it was important to us to correct the record because she, her name had been slandered at Willow Creek, and it had not been corrected. Mm -hmm. So we felt that out to honor her and to be tove and be truth, that was important to do. Well, thank you both for um, using the gifts you have and doing what you can do um, to do something ab about it, to do something about this problem of, of uh, sexual abuse in the church. As you know, and you've written about, there is pushback because there's a toxicity in the culture of a church that people push back against this. It's uncomfortable for us. I felt uncomfortable reading the book. It will be uncomfortable for anyone who is, uh, ho I hope people will read it, but they need to know they will be uncomfortable. There is an inner impulse in us that does not want to believe these things are true. So what could you say to readers who, who need to move past that discomfort? talk about how what leads to toxicity in the church or talk about what Bible verses might be coming to their minds that um, the culture of the church has, you know, ha has just uh, been around us so much we don't realize. So either one of you who would like to answer that or speak to that. Well, I think we have to, um, if we're going to be Christians, we have to face the truth. We have to face the light. And we have to admit that we're sinful. That, you know, it, it's not going to help for us to say, well, we're sinful like him. Well, if you're abusing women, then you need to be exposed for what you're doing. It's a crime. You know, this isn't, this isn't just, you know, that you lied about the score of a basketball game. This is, this is serious stuff. So we think, um, uh, we think that people need to face the truth and the reality that churches are not idealistic, perfect places. I've used uh, this expression before. Churches are not country clubs for saints. They're hospitals for sinners. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know in the churches of Christ, Every Sunday, I think you, most of your churches do this, you have the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. because you need it. Mm -hmm. You need to confess your sins and to take in the wine of Christ's blood and the bread of his body and be refreshed in forgiveness weekly. We need to be reminded that we're sinners. And I have a feeling that churches that focus on confession and truth-telling are far less abusive 
than churches that think, well, that's a one and done proposition. You know, I, um, I accepted Christ. I, for, I admitted my sin. I'm not doing that again. Uh, those are the ones that I think uh, might struggle with this a little bit more. But we believe that we should be confessional communities and we have to admit these truths. Well, thank you to, for speaking to that. Um, our time goes by so fast, so I'll let this be the last question. Laura, I just want people to know that this is ultimately a hopeful book. So it's always good, really, to end on, and, and hope, hope um, hopeful not in a naive way. This is not a naive hope or a, or a you know, glossed over hope. This is real hope. So what word of hope would you like to end with um, in relation to the book you've written and the people who are reading it? You know, we've been told that the first half of the, half of the book is triggering for many and some have to stop and put it down. But we've also been told the second half is very hope filled. And would it be okay if I just read the prayer at the end? I think that- I love that. I think that would be a great way for us to have this be the last word. I'll say thank you to both of you for being here and we will let this be our closing word. All right. Father of all mercy, you know the hearts and minds and acts of all your people. You know all and you reveal your truth in Christ. Grant to us, your people, including the pastors and churches mentioned in this book, to know the truth of the gospel, which unmasks our pretenses, our quest for power, and our sins, and to know the truth of your grace, which transforms us into Christlikeness. Grant further, O Lord, the rich graces of reconciliation between those on opposing sides of these devastating events in churches. Grant this so that we may live in the light knowing the graces of your forgiveness and power and walking in the way that brings you all the glory. Through him who lives with you, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you again to both of you and thanks to our listeners with Harbor 2021.